Farm Bureau helps protect its members in more ways than you might think. They've always been the voice of agriculture in Arkansas, working on behalf of folks like me when nobody else would. And Farm Bureau stands for the values that Arkansas families care about. They protected my right to farm and make a living, which helps everybody who likes food on the table. You know what they say, Arkansas counts on agriculture, and agriculture counts on Farm Bureau. You're watching Capital View, Sunday morning talk focused on the political scene in Arkansas. And welcome back to Capital View. I'm Roby Brock. And I'm David Goins. We're joined now by New York Times reporter Jonathan Martin. Jonathan, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And you're in Little Rock. We're pleased to have you in Little Rock it's, and on our set. Thank you very much. It's great to be in Arkansas. It's a good deal. Uh, first question, when we look at uh, you know 2014 coming up next year, obviously the biggest race in Arkansas deals with this U.S. Senate race with Mark Pryor and Tom Cotton. Last time we talked to you, Cotton had not yet gotten in the race. Right. He's now in the race. Uh, is, this, is this a race that's being talked about pretty closely in Washington? I think it's one of the marquee races in the country, perhaps the marquee race in the country. Um, for a lot of reasons, but, but mostly because uh, Mark Pryor is probably the most sought after Democratic seat uh, in the country. Now, uh, the Republicans want to take back the Senate next year, obviously, and they see Pryor as the most vulnerable Democrat in the country in the Senate in terms of the incumbents to go after because Arkansas, uh, as you and your viewers uh, know well, is a conservative leaning state. It has shifted in recent years toward the Republican Party, but obviously Mark Pryor is the last Democratic holdout mm -hmm. in the state's congressional delegation, so he obviously uh, is uh, a top target for Republicans here. But um, they know it's going to be a tough race because Mark Pryor has a, a, a brand name in this state that goes back for well over 40 years because of his father's service as, as governor and senator. And Mark Pryor has been a very popular figure here uh, in, in recent years. Didn't even have an opponent in yeah. 2008. And here he is, uh, the top target this time around. Shows you how politics has changed in this state and in the country. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I, I see some chickens being counted before they're hatched in terms of the GOP at times in this race and in some other races in Arkansas because they do feel like that the state has trended so Republican yeah. in recent uh, years. But there's still a lot of time for the sands to shift in this race nationally and at the state level based on a lot of factors that are out there. Would you agree? Absolutely. I, politics changes on a dime. And here we are chatting in December of 13. The race is 11 months away. That, that's a lifetime uh, in statewide politics. And the fact is uh, the Republicans are going to try to run a pretty straightforward campaign tying more prior to President Obama into the health care law um, that President Obama passed. Uh, and of course, Mark Pryor will try to run as much more of an Arkansas Democrat, somebody whose roots in the state go back for a long time, and somebody who uh, at times cuts their own path. I mean, to me, the question is, that will decide the race is, is this going to be a sort of nationalized, generic race where you've got a Democrat and a Republican? And if that's the case, obviously, Cotton's got the mm -hmm. advantage. If this is a race that's fought more on local terms, on individual brands, then I think Pryor uh, does stand a, uh, a chance to win. I know we like to look at the map and see, you know, how would one party t you know, take control of, uh, of a given chamber as it relates to the Senate and the Republicans. Is there any way they could ever take over the Senate without Arkansas? It's a great question. It's very hard to see any path for them without beating Pryor. I think you, you have to look at the South, Arkansas, Louisiana, and North Carolina, Mark Pryor, Mary Landrieu, sp uh, speaking of household names and states, mm -hmm. uh, the Pryors in Arkansas and the Landrieus in Louisiana are two well-known names. Uh, and then in, in North Carolina, you've got Kay Hagan, who's a first-term incumbent. If you talk to Republicans in Washington, they'll tell you, if they're taking back the Senate, they have to start uh, with those three seats in terms of the incumbents. There are some open seats that they want to take uh, elsewhere. But in terms of beating incumbents, you got to have those three. You ready to talk about 2016 yet? Uh, it's 2013, so we should, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's around the corner. Lots of talk, obviously, a lot of buzz. Hillary Clinton right. uh, would be the presumed front Have you heard some of that, Roby? I have. Still, yeah. I have. I can't remember where I read that. I yeah. think it was in the New York Times, maybe <laughs> in every other publication in right. America, too. Uh, but anyhow, what, what, kind of what is the buzz right now in terms of where that sits? Yeah. I mean, is it an, an inevitability that she gets in this race? Talk to folks in Washington and New York and uh, Democrats are really uh, uh, anxious for her to run. Part of that, I think, is because they, uh, they want to make history. She would be the first female president. But also, I think there is a sense that uh, 2008 was a tough decision for Democrats. They picked President Obama over her, not because they disliked her necessarily. They just liked him a little better. And the this, this sense that they can sort of write that 
by nominating her next time around is, I think, a pretty compelling factor among Democratic primary voters. You add the fact that President Obama is having a tough go of it uh, nationally, and there is, I think, a bit of um, uh, sort of thought and anxiety about what's next. Um, and she obviously is the one they're, they're looking to. Uh, and there, there, there really is nobody else uh, besides her, uh, unless Vice President Biden wants to run. But nobody in Washington thinks that Joe Biden runs for president if she's running, too. Seems like that would kind of mirror the Bush-McCain, maybe Republican dynamic of, you know, it was tough, tough break for McCain, and then they you know, put him up in, in 08. But, uh, right. yeah, when, when you look at kind of some of your assignments, I know you've already been writing about uh, Hillary Clinton. I know former President Clinton uh, talked about it's too early to talk about this in 2016. Right. Whether we're talking about right. uh, Hillary Clinton or uh, Governor Christie, yeah. it's kind of your job. How do you kind of balance, yeah. uh, you know, not trying to, to, to fully cover, you know, yeah. all this horse race and, and, and go from there? Well, you, you don't cover the, the sort of daily or even weekly machinations of the campaign, but sure, because there is no campaign, but there is a campaign in wait. And all of us who cover this stuff and all of our our, our sources who are involved in politics know that campaigns don't just take place during the campaign itself, that there are things that are done behind the scenes uh, months and years before campaigns to get ready. And so we're going to cover those things and um, th that sort of standard for, for you know, any journalist. And uh, I do think that this campaign is starting a bit earlier, uh, in part because Democrats are so into the prospect of, of Hillary Clinton and because of what I mentioned before, which is sort of... Um, sort of concern about President Obama and, and hopeful that, that, that she can right the ship. And for Republicans, it's starting early because they've lost two in a row on the presidential level and they want to win the presidency. And so I think the combination of, of those two factors, these two parties that are anxious to sort of uh, find what's next, is creating, along with the natural ambition of politicians, a campaign that is much earlier than usual. All right, Jonathan Martin with the New York Times. Will you stick around and do a little app extra with us? I'd be us? glad to. All right, that sounds good. I'm Roby Brock alongside David Goins. You're watching The Capital View. We'll be back to wrap up right after this. One of the real advantages of Electric Cooperatives membership is having a voice in our state's energy future. Not a week goes by without important energy issues making headlines. These are issues that need to be discussed. And you should know that as policies are being developed, the cooperatives are looking out for our members, advocating what's best for you. We are your friends and neighbors. We are your local electric company. The Electric Cooperatives. We are, we are Arkansas. And welcome into the KRK Capital View app extra for a Sunday morning. Uh, we are rejoined by Jonathan Martin from the New York Times. Thanks so much for sticking around for a little bit of extra of smartphone uh, entertainment. Let's talk about uh, something that happened this week, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, House Speaker John Boehner basically kind of teed off on the G, uh, on the Tea Party at the national level. Yeah. Basically said, frankly, I think they've lost all credibility. I don't care what they do. Has he seen poll numbers that show the Tea Party is unpopular? Does he have votes in his pockets to get the budget yeah. deal passed, or is he just fed up with them? It reminds me of that line. I think it was broadcast news where uh, the actor said, "I'm mad as hell. I'm not going <laughs> to take it anymore." Right. I think that really sums it up that Boehner has been trying to mollify the conservative wing of his caucus uh, in the Congress now for the last few years. And you've got these outside groups that are the ones who uh, try to sort of push the Republican members of Congress to more hardline stances. And Boehner knows that he's having trouble controlling his caucus because of those groups. So he's lashing out at the groups. And um, what's interesting is that he felt comfortable enough to do it, which tells me that inside his caucus, um, he sees that uh, those groups might not, not have the sort of same Jews that they did six months ago or a year ago. That, that, that's what I thought was, was, was fascinating. The bigger story here is it, it captures the tension in the Republican Party between the establishment wing of the party and the more conservative grassroots wing of the party. Uh, this is a sort of vivid example of that, but this has been going on now for, for years. It's happening here in Arkansas. You see it between the, the two wings of the party. It's going to play out in some primaries here next year, certainly. Mm -hmm. for, over the private option. Yeah, mm -hmm. for, for both the state house over the private option mm -hmm. that was passed uh, in the Arkansas legislature uh, on the Medicaid expansion as part of uh, Obamacare. You'll probably see it play out in the con congressional primaries, too, here next year. And it's part of a sort of national trend where the Republicans are trying to figure out who they are. 
and there is a sort of, sort of fight for the soul of their party, and it's now playing out in a public way like we haven't seen before. Yeah, we, we mentioned, I mean, Roby and I say private option just like rolls off the tongue because that's that's been such a big, you know, policy thing in Arkansas. But, I mean, it's well, the like, policy issue, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. And, I mean, you, you have at least a, somewhat of a working knowledge. I mean, is there any talk about that concept outside of Arkansas? I mean, is that something people have kind of paid attention to? Absolutely. In fact, uh, we did a story a few weeks back, uh, a colleague of mine uh, and I, about governors um, and the success of governors and their popularity and the unpopularity of Congress. And the most popular governor in America is a fellow named Mike Beebe, who you all may have heard of. I've heard of him. And uh, part of that story, we talked to Governor Beebe, and he told us that he's heard from, I think, a half a dozen or more Republican governors asking about what Arkansas did, the so-called private option to expand Medicaid here uh, uh, in the state, because he's hearing from governors who re realize there's a big chunk of money on the table from Washington, D.C. to ensure a lot more of their citizens, but they, they want to be able to do it in a way that politically they have some cover with their own base. And they see what Baby did here with the help of a lot of Republicans, and they were curious about how it was done. So to answer your question, yeah, in fact, you've got governors in Iowa and Michigan um, who were looking at just that model to try to expand Medicaid in their states. Yeah. Very good. All right. That's a very solid app extra for Sunday morning. Hope Thank people you, enjoy that with their extra we appreciate you. cup of coffee. Jonathan Martin, Thank once you. again, uh, we will have another Capital View app extra, of course, uh, next Sunday as we get closer to the end of the year. Until then, enjoy the rest of your weekend.